Um, well, hey, everybody, thank you for your patience. Um, we are going to go ahead and take the full 80 minutes, though, because that's just kind of the, the revolutionaries we are. <laughs> <laughs> so what I want to ask you all, if you could do is go ahead and mute yourselves um, so that we can keep kind of the extraneous sounds uh, contained there. So I But don't mute me because I'm talking. Can you all hear me? Okay, great. So my name is Andrea Merida and um, you're gonna be hearing from myself, from um, our Green Party presidential nominee, Howie Hawkins, as well as uh, Chris Blankenhorn, who is our media and tech director from the campaign, as well as from Virginia Rodino, who is our press secretary. Um, and we wanna to talk to you a little bit today about that organism that really is the basis of the Green Party and all of our organizing. And that is the local. Um, you know, we do have among our 10 key values, the, the principle of uh, uh, grassroots democracy. We do see organizing and building the party from a bottom up solution, right? And so those of you who, who are involved in organizing and trying to keep the lights on in your green local, um, you really are responsible for maintaining the backbone of the Green Party. It's you're the one that's in the hot seat. That's, all, that's a privilege, but it's also um, a big responsibility. And so, you know, as we were navigating through the campaign um, and, and, you know, really for over two years, we saw lots of commonalities in uh, many places uh, throughout the country and throughout the state parties and, and what have you. And we often see that there are a, a small handful of people in every local um, who are keeping the lights on. They're doing everything in their power to try to maintain, in some cases, ballot status, you know, trying to maintain their social media presence, just trying to do the things to at least let people know that the Green Party exists, right? Um, and that is very noble. And I, I, we take our hats off to those people who are really keeping the lights on, because um, we wouldn't we wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for those people. But now we're at a point where we really have to go to the next level, and that means increasing our our membership, increasing the number of basically hands that we have on deck to complete the organizing work that we really need to do. Um, so um, I'm going to talk for probably another 10 minutes and then I'm going to punt over to Howie um, and then we're going to go to Chris and then we're going to go to Virginia and then we think we have another 15 or 20 minutes for questions and answers. So we'll ask you to save all of your questions uh, for the end of the presentation um, with our thanks. So um, one of the things that was um, very apparent as we were dealing with state parties and local parties throughout the country was that, you know, A, as I said, we have very a few amount of hands on deck to complete the work that needed to get done. Um, but we also saw that um, a lot of times folks didn't have really solid connections in the community. You know, you, they really couldn't tell you who was working on what initiative and, and you know, these other things like this. And, you know, of course, the overriding uh, theme of, of this a &M is anti-oppression. We think that when you handle some of the basic brass tacks of trying to build movement and based on an anti-capitalist analysis and based on an analysis of solidarity and an impetus of solidarity with people in your community, we think that's kind of the calculus we need to be able to build those local those local parties again that are the backbone, um, and so what do I mean by solidarity? Um, and, and kind of a generic definition of solidarity is a unity or agreement of feeling or action, especially among individuals with a common interest, a mutual support within a group. And so, what do I mean by an anti-capitalist analysis, and what does that have to do with with what I'm talking about? So looking at and having critiques about capitalism shows us that the common source of all of the oppressions that we're facing, including the climate crisis, has one source, at least in this country, right? And that is capitalism. 
And that's a system that's built on exploitation of human beings, animals, and natural resources. And it depends and it's successful when we're working against and we're pitted against each other. And so when we have an orientation of solidarity, that is one of the core tenets of an anti-capitalist framework, then we can very easily see that we have a common oppressor that we all need to work together to defeat in order to achieve justice for human beings, for the environment, for the climate, for all of these aspects, right? Now, not every green needs to be a, a, a firm socialist. I mean, I certainly am. But if you can at least understand that capitalism works for the few and not for the many, it's easier to build solidarity with folks in your community and it's easier to outreach as well. Um, now, we have to have an ongoing internal political education on topics of these anti-capitalist ideas and also you know, things related to decolonization um, from the systems of oppression as we do this work. You're going to hear a lot of uh, conversations during this a and about privilege. Um, and what tends to happen, um, you know, some of the concepts of privilege are have been around for at least a decade. We've been having, in, as a Green Party, these conversations for a long time. And I think, you know, movements like Black Lives Matter, I, the, the calls for uh, defunding the police, you know, all of the solidarity around uh, Standing Rock and some of the other pipeline struggles and things have taught us that there is a way of looking at people in a way that requires their silence so that the capitalism can have compliance, right? So this question of privilege comes up a lot. And I have to say that um, what we are, we're kind of in a standstill as a party where we're very focused on the issues of solidarity, or excuse me, of privilege. And we've kind of gotten ourselves a little afraid to operate within our communities and even within our own local parties. When we change the orient orientation of solidarity, in other words, let's work together because we have a common enemy, then we're less inclined to be frozen in place afraid to say the wrong things to people, afraid to use the wrong pronouns, those kinds of things. So we do need to have an ongoing political uh, education internally in our local so that we constantly deal with those things, right? Um, because then we can become less afraid to actually orient ourselves in a way of solidarity. You know, so we have to basically, when we're outreaching to the community, when we're building those connections in the community, we have to fake it until we make it. You know, um, and and when you operate from a solidarity framework, then it's easier for you to show up to these community initiatives and you're not going to immediately start recruiting, but you're actually going to go there to listen and learn. I personally, and I think that is true for my other comrades that are going to be talking today, I personally believe that human beings are good. I think that most of us have a good handle on our empathy, right? And so when you go and listen, and learn and meet people and let them talk to you and introduce themselves to you and those kinds of things, our natural inclination, our human inclination towards solidarity, towards empathy is naturally gonna rise to the fore. So I, I wouldn't worry about that too much. You know, if, if, you're the, if the game plan that you all set in your, uh, in your local is to, is, is to listen and learn and operate in, in a lens of solidarity, then things are gonna fall into place with you assuming that you're also doing your political education. Um, now, a lot of the building that we have to do um, is dependent upon having a strategy and it's dependent about, uh, about decisions about how we make decisions in our locals. And so grassroots democracy is a thing that we have to observe in our locals, right? Um, we have to do some constant work of at looking at our bylaws. You know, do they contain our arcane kind of outdated methods that don't really suit the people that we have in the room and at the table at that moment? Um, you know, we as a as a as a party, we tend to tack toward a consensus process. And I'll, I'll suggest to you, um, uh, so many of you have read this already, and that's the uh, tyranny 
of structurelessness by written by Joe Freeman. And it's a, it's a, it's a short document that was essay that was written kind of in response to what was going on in the, in the feminism movement uh, for a while. And, you know, long story short, what it says is that when you kind of have a system that's an old boy network, and sometimes it's an old girl network, and sometimes it's an old person network, um, and, the, and you're not really paying attention to making sure that within de a, democratic, a democratic framework that not everybody gets to be heard, then you start to create a lot of strife, right? So within our, our consensus process, it can be very good as long as you're making the stop around the room and making sure that everybody has something to say. Part of the problem with the consensus process and why I personally advocate for kind of an up and down vote for everything, and that's the way we do our local uh, decision making here in Denver, is that as long as you seem to go along with what everybody else is going with, you know, the consensus process actually provides a way for you to hide behind everyone else. And then you become dissatisfied because you actually haven't been heard. And so I actually advocate for a, a lot more, um, you know, um, present kind of uh, democratic process. Take that up and down vote, right? Um, one of the dynamics that we've seen in recent times in the Green Party, and if you're in, interested or, or working in local um, you know, um, anti-racism or anti, uh, you know, a police accountability type movements. The dynamic that we've seen a lot of time is this concept of centering oppressed voices. And, and you know, just a quick word about that. Um, we, I understand the impetus behind wanting to center voices, but we need to be able to understand that what what we should be doing is actually listening to people dealing with the internal conflicts um, that 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 might trigger right but not everybody necessarily is suited to leadership and if your organization is running democratically you avoid the problem of having the one person with some sort of an oppressed identity kind of you know putting kinks in the work and taking your attention away from the, the, the game plan that you all have decided to, to use, right? So a lot of times when people quote unquote center oppressed voices, what they're actually doing is allowing this person to become author, uh, authoritarian, right? Whether or not that person accepts what the green platform is, whether or not that person um, is intersectional in their own analysis. In other words, they see the, the linking oppression between all, uh, all these different uh, identities that are oppressed under the system. And, and so what happens is we tend to wanna throw democracy out the window because we're, we feel guilty because we're white, we feel guilty because we're straight, we feel guilty because we may be a little bit affluent. And we throw democracy out the window to deal with that guilt. And that's not the way we should be doing things. You have to have a democratic method of making decisions. You have to be very intentional about it. And you have to make sure that your documents, your government governing documents reflect that, right? Um, and that's going to come up with for, that's going to cause some very difficult conversations in your organization. And so I advocate as well for making sure that you have kind of a code of conflict that you all discuss and that you ratify democratically. Um, you need to define, first of all, who your members actually are, who can actually vote on something like that. Right. And I really advocate for a conflict resolution, a resolution process or a grievance process. I will recommend to you that the Green Party of Utah uh, spent a lot of time in building um, this uh, grievance and conflict resolution policy. So take some time to go over to the, uh, the GPUT website and look at that policy and see if that's something that you can institute. Because the reality of the situation is, is that if we're doing our outreach correctly and if we're bringing uh, more diverse voices into our local, um, the likelihood that we're going to inadvertently stumble on someone's toes is actually going to, you, know, you can count on it. And so that's a necessary conversation that needs to be had. But how do you seek resolution to uh, from uh, for that? How do you get people back onto track? And I think these two documents that you ratify democratically um, really have to be part of what the local does before they go out and start um, outreaching externally. 
you know, another quick word about democracy is um, we have to be honest about the fact that in many places in our Green Party around the country, democracy does not have the same definition for everyone, right? What that what I mean, what do I mean by that? Oftentimes we have people that will participate in a consensus process or will uh, participate in an up or down vote and they're angry about the outcome because they got overruled, right? And then they create, they start hijacking systems. And I mean, this happened to us in Colorado some years back, you know, um, and so your code of conduct policy needs to have some uh, uh, sanctions and escalating sanctions, but they also have to be met with, um, uh, 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 you know, coaching for that person and some educational resources for that person and recalibration. Because one of the things that we've seen as well across the country is that when there's internal disputes, a lot of times somebody does some hijacking. So how can you pay attention to the business of organizing and business of outreach if you're dealing with this internal conflict. If you decide on these rules, these uh, you know standards of conduct democratically before you really start looking outward, that is really gonna solve a lot of problems. Now I just have a, a couple of minutes left and I just wanna talk about strategy on what your outreach strategy is, right? Um, you know, we have to take time to figure out who is doing what in our community? What are the big issues? Who are the groups that are organizing around these issues? Um, you know, what is the e the leadership in this group, formal or informal? You know, um, a lot of times we want to go after the issue that the nonprofit organization is in charge of. Okay, you know, there's like Sunrise Movement and things like that. Those those seem like logical groups for us to go after, but we also have to be honest about the fact that the 501c3 structure means that they can't really work with a political party. So what are the other options that you have? And so you have to be connected into the community. I mean, use Facebook to find out what people are organizing around. Check out where the protests are happening. You know, what are the leftists in your community doing? What is DSA in your community if you have one? What are they doing? And you know, go to those events, see who's there, but try to do everything you can to figure out what are the big problems in your community and who's doing the work around that. You know, Howie's probably gonna talk a little bit about the Australian Greens and their deep canvassing model. Um, and and what, the, what the Australian Greens actually did is that they, they drew up a profile of who they thought uh, was most affected by the deepest problems in that community. I mean, they knew how old that person was. They knew roughly how much that person made. They knew whether or not that person was a renter or not a renter. And they did that by actually having conversations with people. How he's going to talk more about that. Um, so, you know, kind of to bring it full circle a little bit. And, you know, we did say that this, the, you, you have to have a plan for your strategy. You have to map out what you think more or less your uh, tactics and your focuses are gonna be for a period of time, let's say a year, say five years. And you have to attach goals to that. In a year's time, we will recruit five more dues paying members. Um, and you know, that's, I'm gonna put the dues uh, uh, in it as a little note in the back of your mind because we, we have to be able to pay for the things that we do, right? Um, so your, your strategy needs to be how you're going to deal with the problems of the day, how you're going to, uh, you know, grow your organization with members who are willing to contribute. What is your political uh, education ongoing uh, going to look like? Um, and what kind of events are you actually going to hold in order to put the word out there that the Greens are doing something, right? So I don't want to go on too much further because I don't want to, uh, what, what my other comrades here have to say is very, very important. Um, the last thing that I will say is that, you know, I mentioned decolonization very, very um, quickly. One of the things that we need to de decolonize ourselves from as Greens who are anti-capitalists is, 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 is these notions around productivity. The concept of productivity doesn't belong to us, right? If all you can do in a period of time, say a year, is to recruit one member because that's the capacity you have, then that's the capacity that you have and that's enough. What you are doing is enough and you're not under anybody's time frame, right? You, you, you can only accomplish what is necessary. 
So don't get yourself bogged down in goals that you know you, if you're honest, you can't really, you know, meet. So um, with that, I want to punt it over to uh, our 2020 nominee for president, um, Howie Hawkins. Howie, you're muted. Yeah, that will help. Can you hear me now? Okay, thank you, Andrea. I, I, I was saying, I wanna suggest we need to raise our expectations of what we're capable of in our communities. We need to think about being a mass party that is about taking power in our communities. Because what we're really about is social change not just being some gadflies protesting on the side and not really changing anything. So do we have in our local a strategic plan on how we're gonna take power? If you're in a city or a metropolitan area, you know, it's likely to mean the inner city and the inner ring suburbs, the working class areas, are most likely gonna be responsive to our platform, share our interests, the people we can build solidarity with and make up a majority. We're gonna have more trouble in the outer ring suburbs and the exurbs, but we need a power structure analysis of our communities, who's on our side, who are our opponents. I mean, this is the kind of thing that SNCC and the Freedom Schools did. They taught power structure analysis as well as numeracy, literacy and uh, black history because they were about taking power. So I think, you know, that's the kind of expectations we should have. And just a few thoughts about that is, uh, you know, if you're in a rural area, that's neglected by both the Democrats and the Republicans. All that's out there is Fox News, uh, clear channels with 24 seven right wing radio and uh, the evangelical, evangelical Christian stations. I mean, I found that out, confirmed it uh, when I was campaigning. I drive across rural areas. That's all that was on the radio. And that's all that people are getting. And they're, they're not getting their uh, economic issues addressed. They're getting scapegoating of immigrants and people of color and Muslims and, you know, Sharia laws coming and all this crazy stuff. I mean, it's really crazy now. They believe Trump won the election. COVID is a hoax. Climate is a hoax. And it's all perpetrated by uh, self-serving liberal elites. If you're in a rural area, how do you talk to those people? So, and uh, give them an alternative. I think one thing we need to think of when we're organizing is, as we develop a strategic plan, I like the idea of paths of least resistance. First of all, if you haven't gotten involved, what communities, what groups are most likely to come with us first? And that's your core and you build out from that. But I think a lot of locals say, we're a bunch of older people, how do we get the younger people? We're mostly white, how do we get the black community involved? And so forth. You know, we're based in the university, we're the kind of educated middle class, how do we reach working class folks? And what I wanna talk about is, you know, Andrea mentioned the Australian Greens doing deep canvassing. It's really an idea that comes from the United States. And, uh, if you go to Jacobin, there have been some articles about that that are worth reading. Uh, but we have groups like People's Action that was out in Georgia, going into Trump country, talking to people one-on-one, -on -one, you know, in these uh, elections that led to those two senators being elected. And deep canvassing, or what they call in the labor movement, relational organizing, is you go out and talk to people, but you don't preach at them. Say, here's the leap that here are the answers, join us. You listen and you hear what people's concerns are and build a relationship and trust. And this is not the, you know, drive-by canvassing that you do in elections to find out who's with you so you can pull them on election day. This is about getting to know people in communities and building a relationship and trust. Because most people vote with their guts. They don't have a 
balance sheet where they check off the issues. They vote for people they think are on their side. So how do we build those relationships? Mostly the people that aren't voting that are the people we need to vote if we're gonna be successful are working class people who are not so apathetic as they are alienated. They don't trust either party. They know that in our election system, they're mostly uncompetitive one party districts. Why vote? We already know who's gonna win. We get that from the single member district winner take all plurality voting system. And if people don't know to call it that, they know that the, the same people are gonna get reelected who they never see in their neighborhood. So what this deep canvassing is, is a conversations you have, and then you gotta follow up. It just can't be one time. You've gotta get their name and contact info and be regularly in touch with them. If they have email, that's good. A lot of people don't, you gotta phone them. And don't be discouraged if they're not responsive right away. People, you know, they, they got their lives to live. Uh, they may be somebody finishing school or raising a child. But the fact that you've communicated with them and, and shown them the respect that you want them to know what you're doing, a lot of those people will come around when they have the opportunity. So I would urge everybody to, to find out what this uh, deep canvassing is all about. And as you get to know people and they get to know you, um, we've also got to be visible in the community. We just can't be showing up at elections. People will get involved in the Green Party. Their motivation is to learn and to take action. So when you bring people in, don't bring them into the business meetings where you're dealing with the administration of the local party. You know, that's not why people, most people get involved. Some people like to do that and they're valuable. Most people come because they want to learn about the issues, learn about how to understand the issues and then take action on them. So when people do get involved, you know, educational forums and activities and people that may meet us on the street when we canvass and then they see us on the street or in the public hearings or in the newspapers, are, we're being active, then they know we're for real. And that helps build the trust in their ability to have some faith in us. Um, <clears throat> now, I've done a lot of canvassing in this neighborhood in Syracuse, New York, over the years, running for local office. It's a mostly black community, I'm a white guy, but I ended up running for the district council because I've been active on the issues. I've run some citywide races, and it was actually on the QT Members of the Demo black members of the Democratic Committee said, you know, he said, you got to run because our representative on the city council is not being responsive. We never hear from him. And he basically answering to interests outside the neighborhood. So I ended up running. Got over 40% three times, 48% one time. Probably would have won that election, but the Working Families Party sent in dozens of people the last 10 days from all over the state because they are more concerned with keeping a green off the ballot and supporting their working families, Democrats against Republicans and other races, which is a whole nother story. But um, what I'm saying is because of this, and I did a lot of door knocking. I mean, to this day, people come to me, not the district councilor, when they got issues with the city, you know, constituent issues. In fact, some of them think I am the councilor, but most of them just know I'm, I will respond. So I'm sitting in the storefront People knock on the door. I just got a phone call a minute ago from somebody in the neighborhood wants to deal with something. So this kind of canvassing, from my personal experience, I know works. And you know, the political science literature is the most, most effective way to persuade people to your point of view is this deep canvassing or what they call in the labor movement relational organizing. When you're organizing a union, you got to take people as they are in the bargaining unit you're trying to organize. And they're gonna be all over the political spectrum. And you gotta know how to relate to that and help them find their commonalities. That's what organizers do. Greens are very good at mobilizing. When their actions, the green locals are usually called because we can bring some people and we show up. We're great activists, but now we gotta become organizers. And I'm suggesting that this deep canvassing, it's gotta be year round. You gotta be constantly going out there and talking to people. 
and being active in the community. And that's how we're gonna build a mass base over time. Um, and you need to follow up, you know, email bulletin on a regular basis to those who do email, phone calls. And then, you know, the question is, well, when do you recruit them into the party? And my sort of rule of thumb is when they start talking to you, contacting you to find out what's going on, to find out what, I, what you think about an issue. Um, at that point, you know, you know that they're relating to you and it's time to ask them to become a dues paying member. And then the last thing I, I wanna suggest is that, and this gets to the decision-making thing that Andrea was talking about. Consensus has its place, especially in small groups. But as we get large in numbers, you know, working class people don't have a lot of time to sit through long meetings where we're trying to come to consensus. And a lot of times there's pressure to stand aside and really not express your differences over the question that's before us. And a lot of people would rather vote and lose than not be able to express their opinion on that question. They, they sort of feel like, well, they're obstructing. And, and also, you know, when it comes, when, when there are differences, you take a vote. And it's important that sometimes you're gonna lose. I usually lose on the Green Party State Committee in New York when we have differences, but I don't leave. And they've, they've asked me to run for a lot of statewide offices. So, um, and I, I'd urge people to take another look at Robert's Rules, which I consider a revolutionary document. It's a distillation of the best ways to have deliberative assemblies uh, that are democratic. And a lot of people think when they get to consensus where there's not really a manual, there are things like nobody speaks twice before everybody has a chance to speak first. That's in Robert's rules. Um, so I just suggest that that is probably a good guide, particularly when you start getting 20, 30, 50, 100 people in your local membership meetings. You can't, you can't talk through consensus or you're gonna lose the people that gotta go home and put the kid to bed or get to bed early because they gotta get up early for work. So I think that's something else we need to bring into our locals. But to go back to my first point, we need to raise our expectations. You know, we're in this for social change. That means we need a mass party. That means we need to reach out beyond our usual circles, you know, Facebook posts. I mean, just talking about the, uh, you know, if you're a mostly white local and you want to get the blacks and Asians, Latinos involved, look at uh, Facebook networks. They're as segregated as the housing. So we've got to find a way to break through that. And my suggestion is get out on the street, knock on doors, listen, build relationships, get to know people, let them get to know you, and then be patient and keep working and uh, learn how to operate in a larger group than just a small little core group of activists. Because that's what it's gonna to take to take power in our localities. And from there, state legislatures and the House of Representatives and to turn this country around, because I don't need to say that between the climate crisis, the new nuclear arms race, and the growing inequality, and inequality is killing people. Our life expectancies have been declining now for five years in this country, because people can't make ends meet. The average income of people in the bottom 50% of the income spectrum is $18,000 a year. It's poverty. That's a life or death issue too. So. We, we got to be about social change, not just protest. And going out there and talking to people. So I urge people to get online and, and look up how people are doing deep canvassing, relational organizing, and incorporate that in your work in your locals. And really have the aspiration to become a mass party and taking power. Not just running a candidate here or there and saying, at least we protested. We need social change and it's now become a life or death issue. So good luck. Okay, I think I'm up next. Um, I'm Chris Blankenhorn. I was the Howie Hawkins, Angela Walker 2020 campaigns, uh, social media and tech director. Uh, 
this uh, this little bit that I'm doing right now, since we started early, I'm going to try to go a little faster than usual um, and get it done in 10. But it is the distillation of, of three separate workshops that I did earlier this spring. Um, I just got muted somehow. Could you hear me before? It's yes. Muted. Okay. So I just got muted for a second. Um, <clears throat> So yeah, you can find those there. And I've been doing, for those of you that have been coming to the AMs, this is, I think, my third AM talking systems of some kind. Um, so I want to start off by, you know, talking about what is a resource. And this is something that the Green Party needs, the Green Party at all levels needs to think about. Um, we are money poor parties, uh, organizations. We don't take corporate money. Um, we're generally, I know that you know, we're kind of often painted as a very privileged party, but the reality of our, our local membership is generally we're a very working class party. Uh, so we need to be very efficient and we need to see tech and systems as a way to become more effective and efficient organizers. Um, my go to example on this is always what, what do you do with $100? Uh, and I usually talk about this in the context of political campaigns where often the answer that is given is, I'm going to get some yard signs. Um, so, you know, now I'm, I'm going to posture, you know, a few dozen yard signs is about what you can get for $100. But if we were to invest that $100 in systems, you could get an account with a system called Call Hub that does phone and text banking and get 1,400 minutes of phone banking, 2,000 minutes of robo calls, almost 3,000 texts. That's direct contact with people in your community. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're supporting campaigns or anything like that, that's direct contact to voters um, for multiple candidates, right? It's not just one person's yard sign. You can use that for anybody you're supporting. Um, and I think it's really important when we talk about resources and, and systems and tech that we understand that these are tools that support organizing, right? I've said organizing a few times and greens often look at systems and tech as kind of magical silver bullets that can mean they don't have to go do what howie just said that they don't have to go knock doors that that they'll just reach them through social media and that's not going to happen that's not how we're going to grow this party we're going to grow this party by doing the the organizing that andrea and howie have already talked about so you can get a huge amount of phone banking in um and the great thing about you know, a system like Call Hub is that it has notes, it has contact histories. So as you're talking to people, as you're reaching out to people, as you're, you know, calling everyone in your list and telling them about your local meeting, you can have notes on what you talked about. You can have notes about whether or not you reach them. Uh, you can look at that then and say, look, we're never reaching, you know, Jim via phone. Let's try email or let's some, send someone to his house. You know, you can look to use these other, these other opportunities, these other ways to get a hold of people. For $100, you could pay six months of, uh, you, you could get a six months worth of um, access to StreamYard, which is a live stream platform. If you've seen Howie and Angela do their weekly podcasts, that's what we're on. Um, that is, and in, in social media, live streaming is God. Like if there's a, if, if thing, there's a good, better, best, like live streaming in the algorithms is better than best. It's the, what you, you know, it's a huge, huge, uh, benefit to on the algorithm. So it's a way to get out directly to people and you get six months of access to that, right? For, for that much money. Uh, you could, that's a 40% of the annual renter of Basecamp from the Young Eco Socialists. I will say, if you're talking about Basecamp and 40%, you should go talk to your state party um, because it should be more of a, a top down, every local gets to use it type of thing. But it's a great tool for improving your communication day to day organizing so you guys so you all can be talking every day you can be working on things you can be collaborating every day um so to me what i did you know any of the options i just listed are a no-brainer versus some yard signs right the only better expense you might have is if you're doing the relational or relational organizing that hundred dollars might be spent better spent on physical materials at first um so you have things to hand people but outside of that um you know, we really as Greens need to be thinking of what is a resource and how we're using our money um, and how we can do it in ways that we get more bang for our buck. Um, like I said, it's essential to know that, remember though, that this isn't, this isn't a replacement. Uh, they're tools that can make us better. So we've said, you know, how we talked about lists and emails there right at the end. 
the first thing, one of the first things you should do if you're going to start a local is reach out to your state party. Um, first, they might have things like Nation Builder. In Illinois, we have Action Network, where if you reach out to us and say you want a local, we're going to give you a list of all the people in your area. We're going to give you access to organizing tools. We're going to give you access to email uh, blast capabilities, all that kind of stuff, right? So you need to, one of the reasons not only to go ask, how do I become a local, right? I, I'm actually personally not a big fan of going straight to the bureaucratic, right? If you've got some people who are doing some organizing, do some organizing. Um, don't necessarily get bogged down in bylaws right off the bat because your state party requires bylaws. Where, you know, get, get moving when you've got the energy. Um, but as you build, you're going to need a list, right? You're going to meet people. You need to keep track of them. Um, you know, this could be in the local party as simple as a, a spreadsheet. Um, but like I said, first talk to your state party. A lot of state parties in the Green Party use Nation Builder. Um, it is expensive. It's a very good, it's a pretty good list program. It's not very good at all the other things that it sells itself as is a jack of all trades. It's terrible at web design. Um, it's not so great at email deliverability, but it might be freely available to you, right, through your state party. So you should reach out. If they don't have anything, um, right now I tend to recommend that local parties would look at Action Network at actionnetwork.org. Actionnetwork.com is a sports betting website. So actionnetwork.org, they're a progressive organization. They, for starting at free, but for most local pro parties, probably $10 a month, uh, you get access to email blasts, you get access to list stuff, you get access to a whole suite of reports and organizing tools. And um, I'll get into those tools a little later, but those tools are super important because we don't just need to maintain our lists, we need to build our lists. And one of the big problems, the biggest problem, one, it might be the biggest problem I see in the Green Party institutionally, is that we have these lists and we don't utilize them. You need to be make, making regular outreach to people. You need to be asking people for money when you can um, to help fund these things. Greens tend to not want to ask. Uh, locals are a little different. You don't need to ask as much, um, but you should still have you know fundraising ideas and fundraising campaigns and things like that. Uh, but you need to be telling people when you know when are ways to get involved. And how we mentioned you know don't send people to the business meeting right away. It's absolutely true. Our green locals need to have multiple ways to get involved in any, you know, in any month. So you've got your business meeting, right? You should try to do educational events, workshops, panels, discussion groups um, that you can partner with other organizations when you do them and build relationships that way. Um, have a social hour, right? Meet up at a restaurant, meet up at a park, any way that you, you know, and this isn't an official business meeting. And honestly, some of the best ideas I've heard at the business meeting or in the Green Party haven't come in business hours. They've come at two in the morning at the annual national meeting in a bar, right? They've come at 1 a.m. in a hotel room somewhere when people are just talking and an idea that you don't bring up at the meeting comes out and you get to flesh it out. So have many ways for people to get involved and you tell people, right? Every one of those things is an excuse for you to send an email, for you to have touches and get the contact. Tell people when there's local protests that you're involved in. Tell people when there's actions. Tell people when there's opportunities to speak before a commission or a board. Uh, one of my local candidates here regularly speaks before the Illinois Commerce Commission about, um, about a moratorium on utility shutoffs. And that is a free space where he gets to speak publicly on an issue and be on the record of where he's at when he runs in 2022. Um, so we've got to make sure that we use that list. Um, another one that comes up a lot is Civi CRM. Um, it's free, it's open source, but it's not very user friendly. And I, I honestly would say it's a big pull for a single state party, let alone a local. So, you know, I'll keep my dream that one day the Green Party will put its money together and put together a really strong Civi installation that every local in the country gets to use, but we're not there yet. Um, so we should be using all this stuff, right? Um, and then we use that to, to communicate with our, with our current supporters to get, you know, donations. Yeah, Chris is, uh, Wi-Fi is in and out sometimes. So. He's frozen. 
I wonder if Virginia should start. Yeah, so hold that thought, Chris. Virginia, go ahead. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, thanks everyone for the lead into and thanks everyone for being here. So I'm gonna just uh, spend a few minutes talking about some practical points about um, building up uh, your press and your media list in order to help uh, bring more coverage and exposure of the activities that we're doing and the fact that you know, we, we actually are here. Um, my background uh, is in public relations and media relations, and um, I have served as the press secretary of both the Hawkins Walker campaign and also uh, the Nader Camejo campaign years and years ago. Um, and in my day job, I do public relations and media relations work. Um, so in terms of uh, building relationships with your local press, I mean, these are human beings, um, a, lo a lot of these reporters, even though we might dispute that at times. Um, so, so we want to talk with them. We want to actually help them do their job. They, they are workers. We don't want to ignore them, even if we get upset about some of the types of coverage uh, that they, they might do. Um, so it's really you know, trying to understand them and getting them to understand you and uh, building up mutual respect. So know who your local reporters are, research what they've done. Uh, when you send them a note, comment on their past coverage about this issue that, um, you know, you're interested in. Uh, applaud them on that coverage or, you know, make a constructively critical comment, but show them that, you know, you're reading their work, you're paying attention to their work, you're viewing their work. Um, and try to make those linkages with the work, their body of work um, and uh, the work that your local or state party uh, is doing. Uh, explain to them why it's, why it's relevant. You know, in building that um, relationship with them, follow them on social media. Uh, and then, you know, if, if you're really local, invite them out uh, for coffee and talk with them about some of the upcoming projects and, and so on. You can offer them um, exclusives on some of uh, the efforts that you might be doing um, if it comes to that. But, you know, in order to do this, in order to invite them to coffee, to have conversations about what you and your party are up to, in order to offer them exclusives, um, you have to have newsworthy content uh, for them. You know, to help them do their job, it has to be newsworthy. So we don't want to barrage uh, reporters with non news. Uh, we don't want to put ourselves into like the nuisance category where immediately, you know, um, our, our emails and our, our press releases get put into their spam box. Um, but so we need to understand, you know, what is newsworthy, what's relevant, what isn't. Um, and this kind of, uh, you know, exploration by your chapter, by your local, uh, by your state, state uh, party, uh, that conversation will be helpful about what's newsworthy because if you're doing activity and participating in events that are relevant uh, for media to cover, um, then, then you're also going to be doing good organizing work that's going to in turn help build your local or state chapter whenever, uh, either way, even if the media doesn't cover. So if you're, if you're coming up with newsworthy events, it means you know people beyond reporters are going to be interested in, in what you're doing and, and should hopefully join in. You know, some of the goals of uh, this media coverage is that you want non-greens um, uh, to see you and your, your locals activities and understand you know, what you're doing, the purpose of what you're doing, uh, the values behind it, the mission, and uh, you're doing activities that make them want to join in as well. Um, so that's kind of like the philosophical piece of things. It's also the practical uh, relationship building piece uh, with, with uh, your local press. Um, if press doesn't show up, take your own video and photos. Um, you know, put your videos of uh, the, the events uh, that you've captured onto a YouTube channel. Um, think tink TikTok, think Instagram, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, and if it makes sense, because you're not going to want to make a, a TikTok video of a press conference where there's like four talking heads. That's not the makings of a good TikTok video. But, you know, you want to pick the right medium for uh, the type of event you, you want to get coverage for. But, uh, you know, do self coverage uh, if press doesn't show up 
and um, in today's world of social media, you can push it out that way. You can also send um, the e-news releases after the fact with a link to the video with, with uh, photos attached. And that actually, even after the fact, might um, generate more interest uh, when the reporter gets to see uh, visually what's going on. Um, and even if they don't cover it, then, you know, if you stay on their radar uh, with newsworthy activity, then uh, they will keep you in mind. Um, and eventually they may cover, they may cover you. So, um, you know, that's just very basic, uh, but I'm happy to uh, answer more questions. And some of you might think, yeah, it's pretty basic. I already do all that. I already know all that, which is great. Um, that's sort of 101, but I'm happy to dig in more if people have more specific questions. Um, and then I, I just wanna talk about um, building a press list for uh, emails um, that you're gonna send out. And it's not just press releases that you wanna send, send out. You also wanna do like, and in case you missed it, post after the fact. Um, if you do a good event and you have great visuals, you wanna say, hey, just in case you missed this, uh, here's something that happened downtown the other week. Um, you know, if you have any questions, if you want to talk about any of the impact of community about X, Y, or Z issue, um, you know, get in touch. Uh, we, we have those contacts. Um, so, so there are going to be a lot of different reasons you're, you're going to want to email press. You're also going to want to have a press list built up and, and be ready in case there, there is some breaking news. Um, in case, um, you know, a, a candidate from the, from the party uh, is coming into town and you want to um, be able to quickly let, let reporters know about that. Uh, so that press list, um, you know, you can do a number of different ways. There are um, actually software, different types of software you can purchase. Um, you can get uh, into partnership, I think, with other parties and locals or organizations in your state or region um, to collectively purchase um, the software. And that will help you to um, buy, uh, buy a tool where you can create a press list pretty, pretty quickly by doing a quick search and it'll formulate it itself. And I won't go into those nuances, but there is software out there. Um, but if you're gonna do it by hand, which um, is, is more time consuming, but um, you know, is just as good, I mean, make sure that it's updated. And the way that you make sure it's updated is by keeping up relationships with these reporters so that you know if they move to another outlet or left to pursue another career and then you know who their replacement is. So by staying in touch and um, you know, just knowing who your local reporters are, that will help uh, keep your press list up to date. Uh, you want it to be relevant. You don't wanna be sending a sports uh, reporter, something that you know, a political or, or environmental reporter should be getting. Um, and so on. So you, so you want to make sure your Google search um, is, is accurate. Uh, and then, uh, you know, you may be able to pull people's emails from their social media. Often they'll put it in their Twitter accounts. Um, and speaking of that, you can also let reporters know about news events and activities happening through social media as well. It's not, not just through email. Um, so that's, uh, that's just a, a very kind of quick overview of building up relationships, maintaining relationships, and the types of reporters, you know, I mean, I was schooled decades ago um, about public relations, but obviously today we want to expand uh, beyond print, beyond broadcast. We want to think about uh, radio. Sometimes that's a forgotten medium. And a, a lot of times, you know, public radios or uh, small local radio stations exist that can give you good coverage, um, as well as bloggers, of course, in, in social media influencers um, and podcasters are definitely uh, also good types of reporters who you want to include in your living uh, press list. Living means you're constantly updating and making changes to it. Um, so I can stop there because Chris looks like he's back. And uh, yeah, thanks. And if anybody has any questions, just put it in the chat and uh, I can get back to you on it. Thanks. Yeah, Chris, why don't you uh, pick up where you left off? Yeah, um, sorry, blame Comcast. I'm hardwired into my router, so my internet actually went down. Um, I was talking about kind of lists and systems. Um, I just want to reiterate on that because I do want to leave us time for questions. 
Um, you know, at the low, first talk to your state party and see if they already have something that you can use. Um, no need to reinvent the wheel. Um, and even if they don't and you have to do your own, ask them for those lists of your local supporters. They should have lists of local supporters. Um, you know, if they don't, reach out to the national party. Um, but then I just wanted to reiterate before I go to the next uh, the next section that, uh, you know, for local parties, if your state doesn't have anything, um, my recommendation is to look at Action Network at actionnetwork.org. You can get it for free and for local parties, probably as cheap as $10 a month um will be all that you need in the short term um so that is one area where i do want to give an explicit recommendation um i put that list of links up there um i get very explicit on you know what kind of systems and names of systems in those longer workshops so if you want more info you can look there um so i want to move, kind of transition it, it worked kind of worked out that virginia was talking because she talked about you know more traditional media and i want to close with social media um you know, so social media is a tool that can give us access to new potential supporters. It can allow for efficient communication and engagement with, with current supporters, right? So we use it to reach our current folks. We use it to reach new people. We use it to, you know, spread our message. Um, so just like all the systems talk, social media is simply a tool, organizing tool, right? The level of organizing that social media al alone generally allows is creating a voter. Um, but a voter is only useful every year or two, right? So social media is one directional for the most part. If they like your post, you see their name, but you don't get an email, you don't get a phone number, you don't get a consistent way to, to build a relationship with this person, right? Um, so that's why we still need to be doing uh, that on the ground organizing. But we also, as, a social, as social media managers, need to be thinking, how do we get translate you know translate that like into an email address and there are some scraping tools and things that you can you can pay companies to get that information for you but one of the most effective ways that you that we can do it and that we can collect these new contacts is through petitions surveys contests sample rcv votes that kind of thing uh, i'm sure every single one of you if you're on social media even if you're not you're just getting emails has gotten online petition emails right through change.org or any million different sites i hate to be the bearer of bad news but those are 99 percent about collecting emails almost never are those things turned in i, I want to say the only one of those that i've ever been involved in that actually wants to turn something in is in a, is a anti-fracking petition that's been going on for years in illinois right and it, and action network i will say their petition system is set up to help you print out the petitions and turn them in. So they are set up to do that. But for the most part, when you see sign the petition, someone's trying to get your email address. That's what it's about. Um, and that's what those are about for us, right? You, obviously, if we have a survey, what are your top issues? That's important. We can use that information. We can use that data to inform our organizing. But first and foremost, we got your contact information and we know that you're interested in, in local environmental issues. So we know we can now we know we can directly contact you when we've got something going on that's in that realm, right? You we have not we got this information from you, but most importantly, we got information with a way to communicate back with you. So and, and that they're good for your engagement, right? They keep your numbers up. Um, so have but have have surveys where you ask questions, have I sample RCV votes, right? RCV is really hot right now, and the Green Party has been doing it a long time. Just have fun RCV votes. It helps normalize it, right? It gets people used to it. It promotes the system, and we start getting contact information. Um, so doing and, and the Howie campaign, and I know in the Jill 2016 campaign at least, petition surveys, this kind of thing, was a huge, 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 huge source of new contacts that could then lead to organizers, donors, voters, that kind of thing. So, um, and, and again, just talk, mention Action Network again, it's got really good built-in tools that do all that kind of stuff for pretty cheap. Uh, Nation Builder has them, them as well, but it's not as cheap. Um, so that covers, you know, the, the, um, the contact, the collecting new 
information, right? But you should also be using your social media. You, you know, when you have a local meeting or a local event, you should have a Facebook event and then you should post about it. You should share it to groups uh, that might be, you might have some local supporters. You should make sure that you spread it out and you get it out to people. Um, so you can use it for that tool, that those purposes as well. Um, and then really quick, you know, kind of two minute, three minute, how to run, you know, so successful so grassroots social media, consistent quality content is the key, right? Especially on Facebook, you miss a day, they punish you. They miss, you miss a week, they punish you even harder. Um, and as, as locals, we should often think of curation, not creation. If you don't have the capacity to create content every day, look to the Howie Hawkins website or the Howie Hawkins social media platforms where we still post two to four times a day. Uh, look to the National Green Party, look to the state parties, right? Find an article that is, that is, and don't just share the article, but share a caption with green commentary, with green perspectives on it, right? Um, and use a tool like Hootsuite or later, um, and again, you can look at, you can watch the, the longer videos for more details, um, but use those tools to help you schedule out. So you schedule a week out and you don't have to worry about it again. It's, you're not going, oh no, I didn't schedule something today and, and quickly scrolling through your phone to find something. Um, so consistent quality is the key. Um, I, you know, some, I like to tell people with Facebook, it's, the big thing with Facebook is it's still where people generally have local connections on Twitter. They're just people from around the world. In Facebook, you're still friends with people in your community. You're in groups for your community. Um, so it does have a value. On Facebook, for local, you should probably post one to, one to two times a day. Um, Twitter is, like I said, largely non-local connections. It's quantity over quality. Um, I'm not a fan of Twitter. I believe it's a place where the loudest and most obnoxious wins. Um, its character limit doesn't allow for very much nuance. But on the other hand, tying into what Virginia was talking about, when something's happening, Twitter's on the forefront of the discussion, right? So when you want to make, when, when a news story drops, you should hit that local paper and be the first comment, you know, be the first reply to it. When you want a, a, a reporter's attention on an issue, tag them, right? And, and talk to them there. We get so many, you know, requests for interviews for, from reporters just through Twitter direct messages. You know, I remember one reporter's like, we've been trying to contact you. No, they hadn't. They hadn't sent an email to the web to the email on the website. They hadn't used the form on the website. They were Twitter DMing us, right? Um, so it, it gives you that direct access to, to people like journalists, politicians, decision makers. Instagram is kind of the opposite. It's quality over quantity. It's aesthetics first. Uh, don't. It's got video, but it's limited to 60 seconds. So don't dive into that if you're not ready to have a graphic designer work in. Um, YouTube has become huge, right? YouTube is a, has become a social media entity in its own right. Virginia said, put your stuff up there. And yes, anything you do, if you do a local workshop and you don't record it, that means you've excluded everyone but the people who made it, but the, you know, generally the 10 people in the room. Whereas if you record it, you upload it, now people, people who are not able to be there at a specific date, time, and location are able to view and benefit from that content. So, um, you know, make sure that you are putting stuff up there. Uh, TikTok is, you know, short videos, very youth based. Um, I would not encourage a local that didn't know what they were doing just to jump into TikTok. I don't think you'll be very successful. Uh, find a Zoomer, um, find a young person that might already be using it. And uh, because there are, there were Howie TikToks that had over a million views, right? So, um, so, you know, you can, it is a successful medium. I do want to also touch on ads um, for Facebook. Ads are set up to be a trap, okay? You, it seems like a very small amount of money to get double the views, but the way the algorithm works, if you're averaging 1,000 and you pay to go to 2,000, your next post is expected to hit 2,000 without ads or you will be dinged from that thousand. So when you don't make it, boom, now you're down to 900. The next one doesn't make it, and boom, you're down to 800. And you will very quickly find that, oh, oh no, we have to buy ads, right? And that's what they want you to do is in the cycle where you're paying every single day to keep your reach up. It's much more effective for local green parties to simply um, you know, put it out to simply consistent quality content to organically build 
ads have their places for events and things like that, right? Um, there are times when you, you're willing to kind of cut off your own leg to get some more reach and you do it. Um, so they do have their place, but I really want to, you know, encourage local green parties to be, to be very cautious about them. Um, so yeah, just to wrap up, um, a couple final thoughts. No matter how good your systems are, you've got to get buy-in, right? Don't just change and then tell people what this is. Have discussions with people. Um, have discussions with your organizers. Train people properly um, because the best system isn't, um, you know, the best system in the world can't, over, can't do anything if no one uses it. Um, so you really got to make sure you get buy-in. Um, you know, these are, these are tools for use by real organizers. Um, this is really is David versus Goliath. So we've got to rely on being effective and efficient. Um, and as a local, if, if, a system, if there's a system that's out of your reach, start talking to other locals, start talking about your state party, start talking about sharing a resource, because especially at the state party level, and I've done whole workshops on it, we've got to start uh, rethinking what we're doing. So. Um, again, I shared that the, the, the link in there for these other workshops. I've done plenty of systems workshops for state parties. So if your state party wants to talk some specifics and not a three hour workshop condensed into 15 minutes, uh, email me at chris at howiehawkins.us. Thanks. Okay, um, so we do have a good chunk of time for questions and answers. Um, Chris, what, I, what I'd like to request is that people either put stack in the chat or uh, use the raise your hand feature here on Zoom. And if you could just kind of like introduce them as they come along. Um, uh, there are already a kind of a couple of like comments that are really kind of questions in the chat. I, I want to go ahead and, and look at one of them and then we can um, ask people to put stack in the chat and do the other thing. So, you know, Joshua Gonzalez, Joshua, by the way, uh, Minty the green cat lives just about a, a mile away from me. So yes, I see Minty from my house. Um, AOC and Bernie Kratz are harming and diluting the already diluted waters for the green party to be honest, centrist Dems. So one thing that I always talk about is qualifying the lead. Um, and how he pointed out um, about the working class, he, he wrote an excellent piece last year that the working class are uh, uh, alienated and not apathetic, right? And I'm going to ask one of us to put that link uh, okay. here in the chat. Thank you, uh, because I think that's really, really important. Um, we, and this is why identifying who uh, you really want to be talking to is so, so important. We have to be honest that the people that are gravitating towards AOC and Bernie um, still kind of are operating under um, a form of a authoritarian sort of a framework because they're looking for that savior. They're looking for that leader, right? And so they will hang on to everything that AOC and Bernie say because that person is dynamic and they are saying they're hitting on, on some populist notes and that, that kind of thing like this, right? We as Greens need to understand that we build from the bottom up, right? We are a grassroots organization and there is no superhero except for us. We are all we have, right? So when we're talking to people in the community and trying to bring those people on, we need to be looking for that. Right. If they're looking to put all of their eggs behind a candidate and, you know, in that basket, um, that's fine. And we, we should keep contact with them, you know, because when it comes time to running our own candidates and things, we can uh, touch on to them. Because let's be honest, a lot of AOC and Bernie crap people, you know, they are interested in green candidates. And, you know, my personal philosophy or my personal thought is that the reason why they follow AOC and Bernie aside from the whole hero worship thing is because to be honest, we don't have a good control of, of building power in the green party. So they're going to go somewhere. Right. Um, but you know, when it comes to people making decisions in your local, when it comes to people at the table, who's going to help accomplish the goals of your strategic plan, maybe those people aren't the right people. And we have to be looking towards people who have a material need for change. Right. And that's the working class that, Howie Hawkins was talking about. So um, I, I also I want to jump into and just say, the Green Party's got 35 plus years of failed strategy of pulling enough disaffected Democrats to grow. 
right? The Democrats are a minority party in the voting population. You can't make a majority out of it by taking a minority of a minority. The math isn't there. And I just want to reiterate back to the alienated, not apathetic. Um, the, the 2015 Green Party strategy, official, you know, national strategy, calls non-voters a threat. And that is absolutely ridiculous. They're our greatest opportunity. And they're where we need to be focusing. Because like Andrea said, non-voters are the people who have basically decided to stop participating in their own destruction um, for the large, you know, for the most part. And, um, you know, my time as a community organizer backs that up, knocking doors. Um, so we've got to learn to connect with those communities with real connections because they rightfully don't trust politicians. Um, and then we've got Frank with his hand up and then Nema. Hello, uh, I had a few points. Uh, one, one is a, is a long-term social media guy. One of the things that I find is kind of a deficiency in the Green Party is that we don't comment and share and like each other's stuff. And, and these social media programs are based on uh, game theory, where those things give you extra clout in the Facebook world. And I, and I think to some extent, the other social medias, they move you up in terms of your accessibility, kind of like a, where you're got a, a, when they're making inquiries into Google is that people pay for a consultants to help them get to the first few pages of the Google search uh, instead of the last 10,000 pages of the Google search. So, so you want to be uh, managing your social media, the give and take kind of a manner is that I like and share a lot. I do create some of my own uh, material but but really a social the social aspect of it is that we're sharing each other's ideas and we're spreading them exponentially the other the other comment i would make as a, a former 50-year democrat and a bernie sanders uh, democrat but really most of the time i'm to the left of bernie sanders uh, and uh, if i wasn't a green party person i'd probably an independent along with the other half of the registered voters in this country so uh, one of the things that I think the uh, Green Party has to understand is that you have to impress the American people with your ability to govern. And that means manage very difficult, complex subjects and propose useful solutions. Uh, you are the loyal opposition. You're not the guys that storm the Capitol. And uh, you have to convince people that, like the other countries, the Democratic countries that have six to 12 political parties, the Green Party would have to form alliances and coalitions with other people in order to get anything done. So how good is the Green Party at forming alliances and coalitions with other people? So if you look at Bernie Sanders or AOC or something like that and say, well, they're not like us, you've missed the point. You know, the point is, is that I'm looking for people that I agree with about 51% of the time. They're an ally and, and, I, and I, you know, I should work with them. And uh, and uh, I think that's all I had. Yeah, yeah, that finishes me up. Thanks. One thing I will say on the liking, um, I get a lot of requests to like pages of green parties that I have nothing to do with, right? Locals across the country and things like that. While it does bump those like nat numbers, um, likes page likes are a vanity stat. Uh, they are not in the algorithms. Um, and so what we need to be careful about is if you have 100 people that like your page, Facebook is only going to let 20 of them, 30 of them, 50 of them see your stuff. So you don't want to fill your page likes with non-locals for your local party um, because it means it makes it very hard for the actual local people who need to see your stuff to see it. But everything else Frank said, I completely agree. share. The best way we can grow organically is sharing our each other's things, right? Sharing is the big, the big thing that can help us grow in those algorithms. So I think we had Naima and then Camila. Is that correct? Yes. Hey everyone, how are y'all doing? Uh, my name is Naima. I'm a co-chair of the newly formed Green Party of New Orleans. And the most pressing thing that we've been dealing with for the past month, we had our first in-person meeting last month. The next one is at my house on Sunday. 
And we cannot figure out how to get the financial aspect figured out. Like we've gone through Louisiana law, we've looked it up online, we've tried to figure, and we just cannot figure out. I mean, they make it so hard to figure out how to set up the financial aspect because, you know, we need a bank account, you know, we need all that stuff. And I just want to know if anybody can help because I'm lost in the sauce. Thank you. No, you are not lost in the sauce because that's not us. That's everybody else. Um, Naima, so let me just put my email address uh, in the chat here. Um, let's talk offline about that. And, you know, my my good buddy, uh, Alex, is there and I've, I've talked to him a lot. And, you know, uh, the campaign has had a really good developing relationship with y'all in, in, in New Orleans. So, you know, we're still willing to help you all. So please email me offline. I can, uh, you're right, the, the Louisiana, you know, Secretary of State and campaign finance information, that's very arcane. So we, we will help you. So thank, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But don't get too bogged down in it. Don't stop okay. organizing. Don't, okay. If you're somewhere you're moving, keep moving and figure that stuff out, stuff out as you go. Don't, don't, let, don't let arcane laws kill your, kill your energy. Hey, gotcha. and you, you all deserve a lot of props for rebooting that local. It's a very important local. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate y'all. Thank you so much. Okay. And then I thought, I think we had Camila. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Camila Harrison. Um, I'm actually from Inglewood, California. Brand new uh, to the Green Party. Um, I actually left uh, the Democrats in November, this past November. So I was part of the... Uh, the dim exit wave and re-registered a uh, green. So I'm trying to you know, find my way, you know, around and everything. My question though is about like podcasts. Cause I know like podcasts has been kind of like that thing that's been on the rise, you know, lately. And I wanted to know if the green party had, you know, began to dabble in that kind of thing, like creating their own media. Oh, you absolutely should do that. Um, you know, we, and, and Chris can talk a little bit more about this, but I don't know if you know, we have a, a weekly uh, live stream um, with Howie. And, you know, sometimes we bring on guests, but most of the time it's Howie talking about current events. And we take uh, questions and comments real time from people who are viewing. Um, and then Chris turns that into a podcast because you're right, the podcasting is a really big thing right now. Um, there are two tools that I think that you ought to evaluate. One is StreamYard. The other one is Melon, like watermelon, right? Um, so those two are very affordable. One is about $12 a month. The other one is about $15 a month and it pipes out your live stream, which you can then convert into a, an actual podcast, um, it, to Facebook, to Twitter, to, you know, all of these different portals simultaneously. Um, so that's, that's actually something that that's a strategy that we've employed in Denver, so we have a relatively periodic live stream that we put out and we just talk about the current events of the day. Now we do have a platform in Denver. So we tend to focus on the uh, events happening in, in Denver and in the state that, that uh, relate to our platform. Um, we're about to, to get, you know, bare knuckles on our live stream though, because we've got a local uh, Republican led ballot initiative that they're trying to get onto the November ballot to, um, criminalize homelessness to the extent that if you as a property owner don't think that Denver's police are clearing out the homeless encampments next to you, you then could be legally allowed to hire private vigilantes to chase them off, right? And so that's just, that's a human rights violation. So we're going to start using that to let people know that, you know, we're challenging the signatures, we're going to do all of these things like this. And so you absolutely you should do that. the 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 key is pure is regular. You know, do some prep ahead of time. Make it consistent because people need to know where, where regularly where they can find you. And Chris has his hand up. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So, like Andrea said, you know, we do the the weekly live stream just on process with that. And I, I'd said before, you know, never do something and not record it and get it out there. So, if you're going to do a podcast, do it as a live stream. Um. Use something like Streamyard to do a direct to get it to all these different platforms. Once it's done, I download an audio file from StreamYard and I use Anchor FM, anchor.fm to uh, to turn it into a podcast. 
upload the audio there. Um, it's owned by Spotify, so it's automatically on Spotify, but it then automatically adds you to Apple and about 10 other um, podcast things. Um, so that's kind of our, how we'd go from, you know, a live stream to a podcast. And now there's two different mediums in which people can listen to our content. So it's really important to do. Um, and if you want to email me at chris at howiehawkins.us, I'd be happy to talk more about, you know, the process of how I do that. Over. We had George, I think. Uh -oh. Aksha. Can't Have hear you. you. It can't hear you. Hurry, Aksha. I'm not sure if it would be. Say something. Okay, I don't know if it's if it's possible for you, but if you could type your question into chat, we can get back to it um, as soon as we get it in there. Because uh, your your audio, yeah, okay. So I, how are Anna we looking just, on? The Anna just raised her hand, but I think we're past time too. Okay, I just wanted to uh, promote the Green Party series. We're actually having Howie on um, July twenty sixth, so um, look forward to that eight p.m. Central Time. If you want to see my, what I call the gospel of Mike Dennis in action, um, look at Illinois because it's where I live. So all these things that I talk about, we're using Action Network. We have a weekly stream. We do the, a lot of the things that I've talked directly about. So um, we're a good model to see at a small scale how, how this stuff can actually be deployed. Okay, well, I think that we're probably at the end of our questions. I think that we did want Howie to kind of wrap up, uh, give a couple of minutes. And, you know, one thing that I that I, I think that he's going to talk about is how to get in touch with us at the Green Socialist Organizing Project, which we all from this campaign team have uh, decided to transition into. Um, that website is greensocialist.net. And Chris is going to put that in the chat where you can uh, sign up to find out, you know, what we're working on and some of the issues and things like that, that we're, uh, that we're pushing, but definitely building this green party from the bottom up is absolutely what we're trying to do. So I'll turn it over to Howie and then we will all say goodbye afterward. Okay, Andrea, thanks. Um, I think David's, you know, point about literature on political independence, the ebook is based on a long essay that appeared in, uh, International Socialist Review and then Black Agenda Report. Uh, we need shorter material as well. And it's a key question because while I agree that the mass base we got organized are those alienated, non-voting, working class folks. That's where we get the votes to take power. But also, and this goes to the past of least resistance, most Greens are really pissed off former Democrats whether it was the Iraq war or what they did to Bernie in 2016 or 2020 or whatever it is, affordable housing, local democratic parties in the cities are run by the real estate industry and they don't provide affordable housing. They do provide segregation, gentrification, displacement, whatever it is, most of us, I wasn't one of them. I got, they never got me. It goes back to the sixties, long story, but most of us are really pissed off former Democrats. So we're in a situation now where a lot of those people that are following AOC and Bernie Sanders are seeing that they're getting nothing under the Biden administration, which Bernie, you know, is touting is about to do the most progressive things since FDR, et cetera. And they're disillusioned people. We have to, in our locals, be able to take those people in. So that's one point. Um, the press list that Virginia was talking about, I was kind of shocked as I went around the country to locals that I thought would at least have a press list. They didn't. You know, I would come in to do events. I had to pull together press lists on my own to let local reporters know what I was doing. I mean, this is 
something our locals should have. And the, the information that Virginia gave, I hope people were taking notes. Uh, maybe we should have her write it up because uh, that's really important. You know, if you're out there, you're doing things to just the people you're talking to, the rest of the community doesn't know, you're really undermining your efforts. Um, and one point that occurs to me, and I think our campaign should start doing this, is a lot of these reporters, they're on Twitter, they're not reading email. Uh, Chris gave an anecdote about that. So maybe one thing we should start doing is link the press release on Twitter and tweet at these people. Um, because that's where I've seen them, the reporters, they got their, they're looking at Twitter all day when they're not actually doing their reporting. Uh, and I wanna reemphasize the deep canvassing thing. When you go talk to people, I think I said this, but you don't wanna preach at them, say, we got all the answers, you wanna listen. And once, you know, not everybody's gonna answer the door and wanna talk, but man, when people get a chance to talk, they'll pour their hearts out because nobody's listened to them. And even if they're kind of wacko and, you know, they've been listening to Fox News, they just appreciate the fact that you listen. And that's the beginning of a great relationship. Over time, you may have to argue with them, but people respect, if you're consistent with your position and you're disagreeing respectfully, you know, I, I remember this 1968, said offensive. Man, these veterans from World War II, uh, they're all, you know, how can you be against the war in Vietnam? You're not patriotic. And then they all flip like a school of fish changing direction. You know, in the back of their mind, they were wondering, their kids are getting shot up, coming back, messed up from Vietnam. And they were having doubts, but they couldn't admit it until they admitted it to each other. So a lot of times people will argue with you. And the more they argue with you, sometimes that's because they're beginning to think you're right. So you gotta be patient and have a, uh, a respectful ongoing relationship. But the main thing is, listen, don't, don't preach because people are getting advertised that all the time. Um, and that's it, that's all I got. So thanks everybody for being here. Thanks everyone for making the time and hearing us out and best of luck in your organizing locally. Check us out at greensocialist.net and um, let's build this dang party. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night. Bye Thank now. you. Oh, is it night? It is. Oh, my.